So, uh, Raphael, in your talk this morning, you mentioned something that was a big surprise to me. Uh, we tend to think that kids think in terms of number lines, that they always think of numbers placed along the line, that that's something that's natural to us. But you, your research has suggested that, first of all, mathematicians, mathematicians didn't even start thinking about number lines until much later in the 1700s. And you've done work with a, tr a tribe that actually um, had great difficulty placing numbers on number lines. Right. If they would either place it at zero or ten, like if they were asked, place three on the number line, they'd put it at, at three at zero. With small numbers. Yeah, and if they were given six, they might place it at ten, but they didn't have an idea of where they lay along the number line. And it was only kids who had some kind of training or exposure to that. Right. So I, I think, could you just talk? Um, you know, I think we must have a lot of preconceptions like that in our teaching. Right. And maybe talk about the, the implications of your research for teaching. Right. Well, I think that line of research, what, what, what it says is sort of re, what, as I see it at least, is to kind of reconceive what is natural. Right. So there is a conception of natural meaning it's in our brain. Right. Or it's, uh, it's with us through evolution. Right. And, uh, and so on. And uh, there's another conception of natural, which is, which is like um, in a given culture with given um, societal practices, mm -hmm. that thing is, is, is frequent. So for right. example, kids today using iPads you know, and clicking on things uh, is a natural behavior. They learn very fast and they use it without much teaching. Right. But that doesn't mean it's in the brain, uh, right. you know, encoded in the genes and so on and so forth. So, in a certain way, the, the, the study, these studies with the number line, using historical material, but also uh, experiments in the lab, and then also looking after other cultures that don't have the cultural practices that we're talking about, like measuring, like mapping constantly number to space to refer to quantities and, right. and speak of it. Like, I'm halfway through reading the newspaper as if you're going from here to here, and right. that stands for reading the paper, and then you're half of it, meaning you, you still have another half. And all this spatialization, we take it for granted. And you, you so, found with the tribe you were working with, they actually located numbers on places in the body. Right, so they're, 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 this particular group, the Yugno of Papua New Guinea, um, they, are, they use numbers for other purposes, and they have names for them, and they also do body counts. So they, they place, uh, well, they, they start with fingers, but then they go to uh, toes, and then other places of the body with specific locations for those. But um, so they do have numbers. It's not like other cultures that don't even have like a rich lexicon, meaning words for numbers uh, higher than four or five, for example, it would be like one, two, three, many. And so right. There are many cultures like that as well, uh, even today. Um, on Earth. So the, the point here is that this is a culture that does have numbers right. and, and, and names for them and so on. Right. Very distinct. 17 distinct from 16. Right. So, uh, so what, what, what we wanted to test was to see well, if they have numbers, is it, is it a necessary condition for numbers to be conceived that they are spatial? Right. And spatialized along a line or something like that. Right. That the numbers have a location on Right. Exactly. The so world. what we found is that apparently, at least in this culture, even you, you could perfectly well have distinct ideas for numbers, and, and they're not spatialized. They end up at the same place at zero, ten, for exactly. Instance, on the they number fall essentially in buckets, right. in small and big, and right. things like that. Right. So that that is a very interesting finding, we think, because it, it sort of confirms other things that we see in historical record of mathematics. Right. Right? is I said, well, mathematicians apparently invented the number line in the 17th century. Right. If you look at Babylonian mathematics, um, and uh, that's why I'm so interested in having Eleanor Robson coming for our workshop at the fields in, in, the, in a couple of months, is, is that you don't, you know, ba Babylonians were e excelled at number crunching and doing number operations and arithmetic and so on, and there's no single tablet that would have a number line in right. it. So that, that means that uh, the invention, something we take completely for granted today, right. because it's in thermometers, it's in uh, everywhere, right. in, you know, marking magnitude and quantity, is actually a human invention that now we created settings and, and, and so on, uh, classrooms and environments right. where that is now natural, same right. way that iPads is for many kids in the industrial world. However, 
we have to be aware that right. it's, it's not in the genes, it's not in the something that evolved through evolution. And, and, and I think that would have huge implications for teaching because if we assume these things are natural, then we right. skip over all kinds of steps. Exactly. Teaching them. So I've, I've seen some research that when kids, you ask them to line up rulers, we assume yeah. they're just going to line up at the zero and start measuring. Exactly. But many kids will line up at one because they're just, it's something you have to learn. A exactly. um, <clears throat> teacher told me about one student who was using a ruler in grade seven, and when she measured in centimeters, she'd line up the one at the beginning and measure, and when she measured in millimeters, she'd line up the zero oh, and measure. Yeah. And the teacher, and she was a really strong student, she was a good student, yeah. the teacher said, why, why are you doing that? And she said, well, because under one centimeters is written, and yes. under zero millimeters is written. There so you go. So line right. different exactly. things according to. That's right. So I think this is, this is exactly right. So th there's so many assumptions uh, right. that, uh, that this sort of research, which, which ultimately is an empirical issue. Right. What are the assumptions that are warranted? Right. And and which other ones are not? And and, and where do you need to remediate and where do you exactly. need to break things into smaller stuff? Because exactly. these are not natural to the brain. These are things you no. have to. You That's know, right. To and when and it could be, let's say, in, in not as fundamental as a concept as a number line, but many other ones as, that involve notations for fractions or right. whatever. Right. Uh, it could be that uh, certain kids in inner city or another milieus and so on, they have different practices. Therefore, we may assume that right. this is a natural notation when in fact it's, it's not. It's an arbitrary thing that became a practice or a norm in certain contexts for certain people in certain moments of history or whatever. But we shouldn't assume that that's the right. case for... You know, that's, that, that's one of, in developing mm -hmm. our program, we've tried to always use the principle, don't assume anything, try and assess before yes. you start. That's wonderful, yes. Yeah, try and assess before you exactly. move forward with this yeah. thing. Because sometimes things you think are totally obvious Aren't. Yeah, they have a different. Or right. prior knowledge can get in the way. Something that right. they may understand right. differently can get right. in the way. No, I think that, that, that really what is, is is fundamental here is to unpack the obvious right. and and disentangle the elements that are present in things that we think are obvious right. and they're and they're not and and we so they need to understand what is obvious and then why is obvious when it be comes up these. Right. Those are things that are that need a lot of, of uh, um, like studying and, and, and investigation right. and many of these things are empirical issues and luckily we have methods and we're making and improving methods these days to, to get at those. It seems like we're entering a bit of a um, golden age now with cognitive science and neurology where we may actually mm -hmm really be able to yes. figure out how to design curricula I think that, so. that uh, works for kids? Yes. And you're, you're involved with the Field yeah. Institute in a, in a mm -hmm. cognitive science network that's yes. going to try and, uh, one of the purposes of the network is to try and uh, help teachers understand and know what's now known about how children right. work. So right. that's very exciting. Yeah, so I'm excited about that and I think one of the, you know, so perhaps it's not so much like, okay, here we are scientists telling teachers how things work. But it's actually to find out together because right. there are many questions we have no clue. Right. And there are many methods in neuroscience that are over reductionistic for methodological purposes, sometimes ideologically driven, mm -hmm. uh, like claims about things that being in the genes or in specific right. areas of or the brain or hardwired hard wire in the brain, like the number line, for example. But I think these days the methods are more nuanced. And also the newer generations of scientists are kind of understanding the subtleties of all right. these things on the one hand. And in the more behavioral side of, of things, uh, we have new tools like um, like this very digital camera we're using now for filming this right. interview. Well, uh, these, these, with these uh, relatively cheap tools now that you can get even through a cell phone, you can actually record human, for example, speech gesture, you know, core speech gesture behavior mm -hmm. down to a few, you know, hundred milliseconds. Right. That was unthinkable 25, 30 years right. ago with like big cumbersome VHS cameras or whatever. Right. You couldn't share the data easily with your colleagues because you had to make a copy or if you wanted to like rewind and play to see it again and right. then finally you destroy the tape. Uh, I mean all those things. Mm -hmm. And these days we have like a telescope or a microscope to human behavior in a way that we didn't have before. What are the hands doing when the eyes are engaged in some other things? Like what is the thing shared? What's happening with the, in real time? 
and that's more, much more uh, in nuance than what it was in the past. So that, I think it's a, it's a new era, yes. That was so interesting about your talk today is that you found with calculus teachers, even though they were teaching this dry and very <laughs> static formalism, yes. they were constantly moving their hands and that's they were right. constantly <clears throat> using metaphors to do with movement and place. Exactly. And that if you don't, but most people think, oh, that's just a, a secondary part of the lesson, that's not really important. But your, your claim is that if you don't take account of those metaphors, that we naturally go to, then right. we're not going to be able to make kids understand or make sense of calculus. Exactly. So I, I think that's very exciting that your research in the, is suggesting that we could, by watching how teachers teach and right. the metaphors and gestures they use, we can actually understand right. what the deeper ideas are in the right. that are right. embedded in the brain. Yeah. And I think I think the interesting thing is also the fact that you know making teachers understand that a metaphor and analogy and so on, they're not merely like embellishments of something, right. just there for rhetoric, you know, uh, right. capturing the attention of students and so on. Right. They actually constitute the very ideas they're talking about. Right. And, and that is a different different step. And right. I think many teachers uh, should should learn about these methods and these right. results and so on. And it's still a growing field. But it, to, to make that leap right. uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a different thing. Yeah, to go back to the number line, if we're constantly if many of our math metaphors involve movement along a line or you know moving forward or exactly. positions, and but the number lines aren't necessarily natural to us or a cultural thing, that means we have to teach those things very well. Exactly. Or, or because they're they aren't superficial parts of the math, they're actually exactly. how, how kids are understanding the math. That's right. And then usually metaphors and analogies and so on and these mappings that we're talking about, they also uh, they capture essential properties but not necessarily all the properties. Right. Right? So uh, um, you know, if I'm, uh, let's say, trying to convey the idea that, uh, I don't know, in particle physics, let's say, you know, some particles move faster and, and than others and you go like this, well, you're characterizing maybe the randomness of the right. movement, but certainly not speed, velocity, and all right. these other right. things. Right. So, in a certain way, even when you're gesturing, mm -hmm. you may be conveying things that are, quote, wrong, yeah. in the sense that they're not meant to be characterized. Right. So, in a certain way, reading a gesture becomes a technical thing. Right. So a discussion between two physicists talking about the particle physics this way wouldn't create a problem because the communication and the reading of each other's gestures is right. technicalized. Right. But when you teach, you have a very asymmetric relationship. Right. So you may be thinking that you say, oh, here's a random particle, a particle moving randomly, and then someone who doesn't know anything about it say, oh, I thought they would move much faster than right. that. But okay, this guy is telling me he's right. moving just that speed, right. you know, and so on. So that's an ongoing, an ongoing thing, is that we cannot assume those things. And then all these analogies and all these mappings are going to capture part of the, of the essence of those concepts. And we need to learn and teach and disentangle what are those parts. Right. Well, um I, it was really uh, an honor to have you speaking at the conference today, and I, I think it's very exciting for teachers to be able to hear this level of research and to think deeply about um, how things they might think are natural or obvious to kids uh, have to be looked at much much more closely. Mm -hmm. So it's it's an honor to have you. Oh, thank you. It's been really a, it's a pleasure. I'm learning things now. I'm going to learn things this afternoon. I'm learning for the questions, and, and it's really a pleasure, and I'm delighted. And I think uh, you know the, the research program we have kind of overlaps tremendously with the with, the, with your program. So I'm delighted, and thanks a lot for yeah, I hope thinking can, of I me. Hope you can uh, also find some topics to research too. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a Thank lot, Jim. Thank you.